Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Ring Respect Radio, your favorite number one wrestling podcast right here on YouTube at the Video Bros Network. My name is Bobby Munson, and I'm joined by my co-host. He is my video bro. He is the man with the angelic voice. He's Papa Smokes. How you doing, sir? Hey, how you doing? How are you wrestling people doing out there? Hope everybody is doing wonderful, and thank you again, everybody who's been tuning in to Ring Respect Radio and taking the time out of your day to listen to what Papa Smokes and I have to say on this here podcast. If you haven't checked us out here, you can also check us out over on Backbreaker Media. Backbreaker Media available through YouTube, Podbean, and all over the place, spreading the love and giving more respect to the Ring Respect right here on YouTube. It's been fantastic, Papa Smokes. And uh, we're loving our time uh, with our, the boys out in Alberta. And I believe uh, I heard back from Spencer Love. He has officially said he wants to do Ring Respect Radio. So we got to set up a time here, Papa Smokes. We need to get uh, our good friend Spencer Love on the show to do a sit-down uh, Ring Respect episode with him. Nice. So what a great guest to get. I mean, already. Yeah, so Spencer Love over on Love Wrestling will be fantastic. So uh, look for, out for that coming soon. We're going to set up a time. We're going to sit down. We're going to talk to the man himself, so it's going to be a great time there. Uh, but here we are with another edition of Ring Respect Radio, and we're once again going to be tackling a wonderful world of reviews. And we're talking about Major League Wrestling, MLW, MLW Fusion, and we're going to be going over episodes 119 and 120. But before we get started on that, I want you to go ahead and click the subscribe button down below. Give this video a thumbs up and turn on the notification bell. Hey, it takes a couple seconds out of your day, and it makes a big difference to us here at the Video Bros Network. And we appreciate everybody who has already done that already. Thank you very much for all the love and support you show us here on Ring Respect Radio. Now let's get right into it, Pop Smokes. We're talking about MLW Fusion episode 119. Why don't you uh, kick us off with this one? Sure, sure. This episode 119 started with the promo package of uh, Savio Vega and Richard Holiday. We're going to be seeing their big match uh, in the main event, in the Caribbean strap match for the Caribbean title. So a little package there. We also had uh, uh, Joseph Samael speaking for Contra on the injustice, and he is uh, uh, promising the destruction of injustice by the uh, by his evil army Contra. Yeah, he was uh, none too happy, especially after the actions that Injustice took on the last episode we were talking about when they masked themselves as the uh, Sentai Death Squad members and it snuck, they got a good sneak attack in on the members of Contra. Uh, hell to be paid, I'm sure of it, Papa Smokes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, like we've talked about before, Contra's got a couple of feuds going on. They, they have a number of members, but uh, spreading themselves in here, they, they've got the ire of a lot of wrestlers in in MLW, and uh, they're fighting this fight on a number of different fronts. Yeah, they sure are. Uh, hopefully they aren't spreading themselves too thin, but you know what? Uh, their actions will speak louder than words. We'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, so what, uh, up next on the show, We uh, first match of the night, or was there anything I missed there? Well, we had uh, Zenji, the, uh, the uh, Lucha star versus the Laredo kid, the current triple a cruiserweight champ and uh what a nice quick moving high flying match this was what did you think of this one Munson? yeah i mean it was exactly what it should be i mean this was a fast-paced uh, great match the between two guys who are in that weight category that middleweight category that mlw's really been pushing forward with uh that you know uh leo rush of course the mlw middleweight champion and these are the guys who they're trying to make stars out of right now so that we have a lot of competition go, going forward for Leo Rush a lot of possibilities in matches and man these two really got to shine here Papa Smokes I feel like we've we've really talked them up especially Zenchi has been you know really growing on us after the last match that we saw of his now at this point Zenchi is really growing on me I'd say this matchup with the Laredo Kid his best matchup, of course, it helps that they match up size-wise and style-wise as well, too. But definitely Zenchi's best piece of work we've seen from him to date so far. Yeah, yeah, I have to agree with that also, Munson. Uh, Zenchi uh, often used as kind of like a preliminary in major this uh, and, and he was in this day, too, uh, even though it was a title defense for the AAA Cruiserweight Championship. But uh, 
I thought when she looked in this, uh, he grappled with the Laredo Kid for the first three or four minutes of this match. Uh, uh, lockups, lots of holds, lots of uh, reversals and such. Um, you knew at some point that it was going to get into some big tactics with these. It, 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 um, but there were, a, it didn't look like these two used to work together. There were a few moments were sloppy, but uh, Zen should be looking really, really good uh, as a point. In a losing cause in this match, but uh, uh, you know, kid also looking to end as a as a lesser star. Uh, this match worked on both levels. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, I think this match got got Zenchi over, and also the Laredo kid as the champ, and uh, a good solid uh, preliminary match there. I, I was entertained. Yeah, it uh, went a little bit longer than the typical kickoff match on an MLW show, but. I had no issue with that. A good, solid 10-minute starter match. Uh, quick pace, fun to watch, like you said, getting both guys really over. Um, once again, despite all his losses, Zenshi still looking like he continues to grow a little bit as a, as a wrestler, somebody you want to watch each and each time. And, you know, so many people talk about losses hurting guys. It only hurts a guy if it's done in a way to really bring them down, I find. And MLW has found a good way of building Zenshi while at the same time not yet having him go over. And you know that when he does finally, it's going to be a magical moment. Yeah, I think you're totally right about that. And this is a, probably a, a talent you're looking at for the future. Of it. He does look like he uh, hasn't been in the game all that long, but skills, uh, skills totally there. Um, personality there. He just needs more matches in the ring, more quality competition, and I think this guy will be one of their uh, one of the mid-mers or uh, you know contender to the uh, middleweight championship. For sure. And so afterwards, we got a promo from the Laredo Kid. Uh, Laredo Kid wanting to make a challenge to Leo Rush. He wants to put that AAA championship on the line against the middleweight champion MLW's Leo Rush. What do you think of the promo and the potential for this matchup? I thought it was a pretty good promo. Um, no kid looked like he's all not comfortable speaking English, but he definitely got his point across. And yeah, he, he wants stuff. He wants a match with Rush. He wants the MLW Middleweight Championship, and he's not going to stop till he gets it. Apparently, so we'll have, we'll hear from Leo Rush possibly later on in this. Uh, maybe a response to the challenge, but. Uh, Laredo kid, uh, I, I admire his gumption. He's he, he wants uh, the MLW middleweight title, and he's willing to put the AAA championship on the line in order to get it. Yeah, looking forward to that one if it does go down. And uh, from there, it was uh, more promo time. There was a lot of promo heavy on this uh, episode of MLW. Not that that was a bad thing. I uh, would believe the next one up was Myron Reed now in response to uh, Contra and stuff like that. So Myron Reed getting a chance to cut a promo here back at Sa uh, Joseph Samael and the members of Contra. And uh, man, he's really just kicking ass on these promos as of late, just making you a believer out of the fact that he's uh, he's ready to get in there and fight these guys. Yeah, I've watched uh, MLW for a couple of years now, and, and I've watched... Uh, that faction and justice just improve throughout time and probably Meyer and Reed more than the other guys, uh, both in the area of in-ring and promo. And I like his promos. He, he's very serious. He stares right into the camera. He's got his words uh, perfect and straight all the way through. He sounds committed. He sounds very serious. And uh, I like his style. Yeah, I, I got to say he's, he's really grown on me, Papa Smokes. I'm loving these promos. I uh, really love that match he had with Leo Rush. Looking forward to seeing some more in-ring ma matches of his as well, too. And like you said, I'm glad you pointed out the fact that he looks right at the camera because there's a lot of guys who just have that tendency to kind of glare away a little too much. And he looks right at you. He lets you know what he's saying. He's speaking it with his words, but he's also speaking it with his eyes. And that's a big deal when it comes to uh, working video and stuff like that when you're putting out material for video you want to make sure you're making that contact because you're that's your audience right there i mean so many people are trained to look around look at the audience in a a live setting and stuff like that a lot of these guys especially the young ones don't know that you gotta sell to that camera that camera is what's going to be getting you over uh next week the promo package 
Gavin Ross and Marshall Von Air in Hawaii. They had some words to say about uh, Filthy Island and about their uh, tag team title loss to Lost Parks last week. Uh, not too happy about that, but uh, good baby faces. They're willing to work hard to get back to where they were. Um, followed by this was a promo from Lost Parks. Uh, quite thrilled to have their tag team belt been after for a long time. Uh, this was a good promo in Spanish from uh, Lost Parks. Those guys don't mince words too much, and uh, they typically have no respect for any of their opponents. They don't care who wins the uh, the uh, tag team title number one contender spot match tonight between Violence is Forever. And saying it as it is, they, they don't mince words. And what they said was they don't care who the number one contenders are for the tag team title, which we have a match to determine tonight between Violence is Forever and TJP and Buku Dao. The Lost Parks not caring and not having any respect for any team that's going to come up to challenge them. So uh, they're ready. And I'm looking at a possibly long and uh, tyrannous reign from Lost Parks. So what do you think of these guys? I, I like this promo a whole bunch. I did too. Yeah, I mean these guys are are fantastic. Obviously, uh, L.A. Park's been around the business a long time, and this is a great way to get his son over and into the business. And you know, like this just it, it absolutely works. I mean, obviously their their win was uh, was one that uh, comes with a little controversy and stuff there, but I mean it, it it was perfectly done in building these guys as that dastardly heel team that you want to hate. Which, you know, makes great for when the baby faces are going to go after these guys and after those title opportunities. It's it's just absolutely perfect. You want that good, you know, really good heel team to go up against your really top baby face teams so that there is enough tension to make it feel like the fight is worth a damn. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I'm looking forward to this title match as it comes up and looking forward to seeing what Lost Parks will offer in uh, defending the MLW tag titles. And won't this be funny, though, too, because one of those teams' violence is forever. If they win that number one contendership, keep it in mind that it was uh, Team Filthy's leader, Tom Lawler himself, that assisted in that win for Los Parks and getting them the championship. Will violence is forever even uh, decide to take up that opportunity to go against Los Parks, or are they going to uh, just uh, allow that one to slide right by for the time being? For sure, and... When Tom Lawler was uh, made special referee of this match by Selena De La Renta, you know that uh, uh, that Lawler and Lost Parks have a common enemy in the, the Von Erics. So I, I imagine that it was in Lawler's mind that, well, if I can screw over the Von Erics, then I can now get my team into a position to challenge for the titles. First things first, you know, he wanted to get uh, his revenge against the Von Erics and definitely did so by uh, uh, allowing them to get the belts taken off them. Yeah, certainly. So, uh, But, I mean, we're talking about already what I think that was what uh, comes up next here, if I'm not mistaken, is the actual number one contender match uh, between these two teams. If, if Unless I missed something here, Papa Smokes. Oh, no, no, I think that's what we're on now. All right, perfect. So, yeah, as you laid it out before, Violence is Forever versus TJP and Buku Dao. Uh, this one, a good, another solid 10-minute matchup uh, between these two teams. And did the, did the finish of this one surprise you? Like, the match itself was was okay. It was decent. I wouldn't say it was my favorite by any means. It was not too bad. But what about that ending? How, how did that work for you, Papa Smokes? Yeah, I, I was surprised by the, uh, by the eventual outcome of the match. I had kind of thought, uh, in my own mind, kind of booking it ahead and in my mind that uh, violence is forever would go over but uh, they've also got a little story uh, uh, brewing up here between TJP and Buku Dao of course uh, the master and the teacher and uh, it, it, it doesn't seem like it's going too smoothly between uh, TJP and Buku Dao so I, I kind of anticipated maybe some problems of teamwork in that team or psychology or something but uh, and uh, uh, things didn't go great for Violence's Forever. And uh, what do you know, TJP and Buku Dao picking up an exciting win in that match and uh, moving into that number one contender spot for the tag team title. Yeah, and I, I think the reason that it works too is because obviously TJP and Buku Dao as of now, you know, 
these are the baby faces. It makes sense, them versus Los Parks. It's a good match for Los Parks to start their title defenses against as well, too. Well, violence is forever. Yeah, okay, maybe I, I thought too far ahead and thought these guys were going to be maybe booked as a strong, dominating team right off the hop, and they take their first loss in their second match in. Kind of shocked me a little bit. But again, I think it's one of those losses that you could also use to build on their aggression moving forward and stuff like that. Allow that to be their driving force, not to allow a guy like Buku Dao to get one over on them or something ever again kind of thing and make them into the dominating team that they definitely could make out of these two guys. That's a good thought too. And uh, yeah, like I say, I think another part of it might be that they're they're uh, building this uh, issue between TJP and Buku Dao as the as they're falling out is is starting the cracks in their relationship are showing now and uh, perhaps once uh, TJP and Buku Dao have their uh, title match that's where we might see the implosion and then a feud between those two in the singles ranks. I'm just uh, speculating here, but uh, maybe that's the. Uh, the story they want to go with sooner, and then uh, uh, for now, violence is forever can uh, can continue. That they'll be in the team filthy for a while. They're they're uh, probably like a a semi permanent team on the ranks here. So uh, yeah, I imagine they're just going with uh, the one storyline over the other at this point, and uh, we'll see if, if this uh, meltdown occurs by uh, by next week with the title match. Well, plus, you know, violence is forever going to have their, uh, you know, time in the sun uh, as they head out to uh, Filthy Island coming up in the next few weeks on uh, MLW Fusion. So a lot of chance for those boys to shine yet still and for anything to unfold with them as well, too. So we'll see what happens in the tag team title matchup, Los Parks versus TJP and Buku Dao. I mean, congratulations to TJP and Buku Dao. And man, Buku Dao, man, that's really coming across as a guy that they really want to push forward in MLW for sure, because this is two relatively, I, I would say relatively big wins for a young uh, baby face like this so far. Very much so. And uh, possibly there's plans for Buku Dao to be a, a more prominent singles competitor in their ranks. We don't know what their long-term booking plan is. So of course, just, like all the fans, we'll have to sit back, watch, and see what happens. But uh, there was one other quick thing I wanted to bring up about this match, Munson, is that we talk about uh, MLW as having a, kind of an international flavor to it, different styles of grappling and all that. I, I enjoyed and appreciated uh, Dominic Garini and Kevin Koo in this match because they don't look like the typical pro professional wrestlers we're used to watching these days perhaps say in the bigger companies or, or even like the styles of TJP and Buku Dao, uh, Garini uh, just uh, doesn't seem to care to wrestle the, the professional wrestling style that much. He go, he does his grappling. He, he, he sat down on the mat and wanted to start the match like that. And uh, he uh, just has an unorthodox style for pro wrestling, which is which is really saying something, I guess. But uh, uses that strict uh, jujitsu style, and it, uh, also Kevin Koo uh, with the martial arts style. It, it's refreshing. It's fun to watch someone work a different style, and watch their opponents have to work a different style. You, you know as well as I do nowadays. Uh, in the business, many people wrestle in a very very similar style. Uh, including, uh, you know, the lots of the flippy stuff and the reversals and, and all the uh, high-impact, high-speed aerial kind of style that's so popular today. But just refreshing to watch a, a martial arts-based grappler uh, do a lot of his work on the mat. Yeah, you know what? I'm glad you brought that up, Pop Smokes, because it was fantastic to watch. And these guys are great. I think that's one of the reasons, too, I was shocked by the finish is because I was enjoying watching them so much that... I felt there was something more with these guys, but their their time is coming. Uh, they don't, yeah, again, they don't necessarily look like your typical wrestlers. And I think that, again, given more time in a professional wrestling ring, they'll be able to develop some of those styles into something that I think will stand out and catch on. And even to the, you know, the modern fans that love the reversal and flippy stuff, 
I think every once in a while they do really enjoy somebody who stands out for being quite different from what the norm is currently. And I think that there is potential for one or both these guys to make that impact in the years to come. Yeah, I like it. I, they have a good spot in MLW now. And like you say, I think we'll see them develop throughout time. For sure. So, uh, not sure if there was anything else up next in between other than some uh, more from uh, Stephen Pinu and a few uh, commercials. Uh, any promos I might have missed before the main event here? Uh, the, just something of note. They had a promo with uh, King Mo. Mm, yes. He was kind of uh, laying some shade on low key, saying that, uh, you know, we've got to stop him from wrestling. He's got too much head trauma and. Uh, He's, he should be banned from wrestling, but I think this is a, this is a work, of course. He's, he's mo- and I think King Mo is obviously uh, trying to lay the foundations for a little uh, sequence with Low Key. That could be a really, really interesting feud. Yeah, and it would uh, it, it would be building off of what uh, already started between the two of them. Uh, you know, they uh, had a match quite a long time ago that they continue to show us promos of and stuff like that and tease that there is something else coming uh, between Loki and King Mo. And you know what, uh, for what it's worth, I'm excited to see that one go down again. All right. And then from there, Papa Smokes, we are heading to the main event of MLW Fusion 119. We talked about the build up to this one in previous episodes of the show. This is going to be Richard Holiday versus Savio Vega. This is the Caribbean Championship to decide who truly is the Caribbean champion, the IWA Caribbean champion. And this one, a Caribbean strap match. A lot set up here. This is the same strap we mentioned before that Savio Vega used in his infamous strap match with Stone Cold Steve Austin. And now it's going down, him and Richard Holiday. Uh, do we want to maybe just run down the rules of a Caribbean strap match in case anyone here has never seen one before? Uh, yeah, let's do that, sure. So, uh, that, yeah, yeah kick, kick us off with that there, Papa Smokes. Oh, I was just going to say uh, uh, there. Strap matches and bull rope matches go under various names, I think, and, and it just really uh, really depends where the match takes place or what the stakes are. But uh, in this Caribbean strap match, it's done the same as a, a traditional strap match or bull rope match in wrestling where the two combatants are uh, fastened at the wrist to a, a long strap. And uh, in order to win the match, uh, the, the winner must touch all four turnbuckles with without interruption to all four without the other guy touching any. Yeah. And so that's, uh, that's generally how the strap match goes. Um, so this one, uh, went down and like, uh, I gotta say it was before we even get to the finish of this one. I mean, it's Savio Vega. I mean, he's, he's always been just, he, he's an all right wrestler to me. Like he's, there's nothing wrong with him. But he's never been one of these guys where I'm like, hey, I really got I, I got to rush out to see a Savio Vega match. So nothing about this other than Richard Holiday's involvement screamed to me, I need to see this matchup. But it was it was well built up. I got to say that. And I got my opinion personally. I thought the finish was quite entertaining, and even more so once we get further to other episodes where they follow up to let us know more about it. But that's for a different time. My personal opinion, I thought it was comical, it was interesting, and quite frankly, I think it's great that Richard Holiday is walking away the Caribbean champion. Yeah, and legitimately this time, too, they, uh, and he's actually won it, and they'll have to get it off him, which is really funny. Yeah, it is quite entertaining, but I mean, all in all, if, if you're to pick this one apart, this was probably my least favorite match of the entire night. When I pick apart it as an actual wrestling match, because there was little to no wrestling involved in this entire segment. Yeah, it agreed. It wasn't match. It, it did the trick for what they needed here. I think uh, right off the bat, Savi Vega, uh, like veteran, but he was experienced in this style of match. He was quite getting the better of Holiday, using the strip, whip, choking, kind of. Um, Holiday looked like a little bit out of his element in this match. You know, he's kind of more used to the typical uh, in-ring wrestling match. But uh, it was open, and we had some of that fire we'd seen in Savio Vegas' pro 
match where he was talking about uh, the pride of the Caribbean and Puerto Rico, and they didn't like being respected by this jerk, uh, Richard Holiday. He wanted to get him and stand up for the pride of of his country. His country, and you saw some that uh, in that when he was laying the trap across Holiday's back, so it did well to do, and we given it to uh, again finish. Uh, we've We've seen our problems in MLW recently with some uh, paid-off refereeing and such like that. And uh, by the time uh, Vega was poised to win this match and touch that last turnbuckle, the, the referee was standing in the way and uh, was you know, unwilling to move for this uh, climactic point in the match and then ended up moving so that uh, Holiday could touch the last one and, and thus win the match. Then we're informed that this referee is actually the disgraced NBA ref. Uh, what is his name? Tim Donahue. And uh, that's a pretty funny guy to get because uh, he was involved in a scandal in the NBA a few years ago. Uh, he was match fixing as a referee. And, uh, obviously, to make some money on his bets and all that, got kicked out of the NBA. Obviously, we have a hard time uh, refereeing a any traditional sport at this time, but uh, in professional wrestling, hey, you might still have some use here, as we've seen. Yeah, I thought that was fantastic in finding out that information. I mean, it was the icing on the cake, the fact that this guy actually was a match-fixing referee. Now they can use this. Um, Richard Holiday, if he uses this guy as his personal referee, and there's so much that can go down here, and in so many ways works perfectly for Richard Holiday and the development of him as a character. Uh, fantastic in terms of the finish and the fact that there's now this Caribbean championship that maybe now can legitimately be used in MLW as well too, which is great to see in so many ways. Um, again, the match itself, eh, could have done without it. As a whole, MLW episode 119 for Fusion, I hate to say it, Pop Spones, probably overall my least favorite episode we've reviewed so far. Yeah, yeah, you might be onto something with that, but uh, uh, I think it, it still did the trick in terms of uh, building storylines and such. We just had a couple of matches that were a bit tepid, I suppose, and uh, for whatever reason, but uh, uh, off nights happened, and uh, they still got story and so uh, we'll look forward to the next step, so being better. Yeah, and you know what? Uh... That's a good segue into the next episode, which is the next part of our show here tonight. MLW Fusion episode 120, and uh, we kick things off right away with a Myron Reed promo on this one. Again, uh, really setting the setting the tone for this injustice and contra feud that is, un, you know, developing right before our eyes. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, they've had their separate matches uh that is, Oliver and Reed have had their singles matches against uh, members of Contra, but they've made it uh, known for the few uh, after this episode they want to do things as a tag team, which which would probably mostly put them against uh, uh, Simon Gotch and uh, and somebody else in Contra, either Jacob Fatu or uh, one of the other members. But uh, for probably. tonight. Or even uh, Davari would probably be the other choice, I would say, in that case. Yeah, that would be a good choice. Yeah. But uh, based on the previous uh, sneak attack with the uh, Injustice impersonating the Sentai Death Squad, tonight we have as an opening match Sentai Death Squad, one member of Contra versus Jordan Oliver of Injustice. And what did you think of this match? Well, before we even talk about this matchup, when Jordan Oliver walked out, did you not also make the note before the commentators mentioned it about this guy looking bigger than he's looked in recent weeks? Yeah, I noticed uh, it, it would be hard to get any skinnier than Jordan Oliver, but he looks like he put on a couple pounds. Yeah, he definitely did. Like, I knew he was always a tall guy, but he kind of had that tall, skinny, lanky look to him before. And it looks like he is, uh, he must be hitting the gym hard or something like that. He's on a new regimen, maybe a new, uh, eating regimen of some sorts as well, too. Maybe he's going to the gym with Hammer lately because, you know what, he looks like he's trying to build that uh, that body that's already there because, I mean, the kid's got physical height behind him. If he can build some muscle tone on top of that, 
we could be looking at a whole new Jordan Oliver coming up here. Yeah, and even for a guy has he's he's pretty agile, like he's quite quick and can do the aerial moves good. But I think it was an important thing for him to put on some weight. In the, you're, you're a professional wrestler now. But look big. You can't be the skinny guy all the time. And uh, I don't know if he's looking muscular yet, but he's just looking a bit thicker throughout his chest and all that. And he really needed that. Uh, I don't think he's the 220 pounds he claimed to be on this episode, <laughs> but he, he's a few pounds up anyway, and that's a good thing. Yeah, well, you know, as wrestling goes, they don't always tell you the truth about the weights of the guys coming down to the ring. Of course. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the match itself, it, it was what it was. It was a squash match. Jordan Oliver destroying the member of Contra, the Sentai Death Squad member. I mean, was there any other way to go with this one, Papa Smokes, without it being ridiculous? I, I guess not, but... Um... The only thing I thought is just that it, it's a little bit questionable as to why Tavari would show the Sentai Death Squad guy out to the ring and, and not have the match himself, or why Contra would would put one of their you, you know their bums in the ring, so to speak, instead of one of their actual members. Uh, but um, yeah, this match just again is a little bit blocked for the uh, building the feud between Estus and. Uh, uh, excuse me, Contra, and uh, yeah, Oliver, you know, made to look strong and tough in this match, basically a squash very quick, and uh, it builds a little more tension into this feud. Yeah, and then uh, afterwards, we got that promo package from Jordan Oliver afterwards, and I gotta say, I gave this one a big old thumbs up, I gotta say, probably the best promo Jordan Oliver's delivered, and the one that's made the most sense since uh, coming back to this whole MLW return. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the kid can talk. Uh, he likes to do it a little bit rap style, and uh, it sounds good. I think the younger people like it a whole bunch, and uh, I think this guy will just polish up his style both in the ring and on promos uh, as time goes on. I think he's pretty young. I think he's in his early 20s, so... Uh, easily cut the guy some slack but he's improving and that's what we all want to see is 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 a person improve throughout time and get better yeah and he's one that uh, has continued to do so and you know i don't mind that at all personally i mean i i always give somebody the benefit of the doubt when they're at least going out there and you know making a serious run at it i mean jordan oliver's not going out there and trying to make wrestling seem silly at all kind of thing he's out there he means what he's doing and he's working on improving it. And as a fan, I think it's great to watch a guy improve and get better over time to see what they can become. Yeah, we're going to see. He's got a. He's bitten off a big chunk to try and chew up in challenging uh, not only Contra, but Jacob Fatu. I don't know that Jordan Oliver is quite ready for all of that yet, but I admire his, uh, his tenacity. And uh, him and Myron are going to go head-to-head against Contra and we will see what happens in the coming weeks and months. Yeah, sometimes they say more more guts than glory, but hey, it's gotten guys over in the past, so we'll see where it leads for Oliver and the and Myron Reed and Injustice in general. Uh, after that, uh, again, we already talked about Tim Donahue uh, being revealed as the uh, controversial ref from the previous episode, so we won't uh, touch too much more on that part. But then... We had the Von Erichs, another promo, this time talking about the upcoming Filthy Island. And this one, great, because they're talking about how Filthy Island's going to be hosted pretty much right in their backyard. Who knows what could go down at Filthy Island if the Von Erichs are right near home. Yeah, and I've still been trying to figure out exactly what Filthy Island is going to be. I guess by the end of this episode, it becomes fairly clear that uh, it is going to be an episode of fusion, I think, right? With... uh, with a card with matches and promos and such, but it'll just be hosted by Lawler. Is that what you get out of this, Munson? I think it's going to be an episode of the show. Yeah, I think at this point on Fusion, they had pretty much kind of teased that a little bit. I wasn't 100% sure how it was going to go, but I think they also, uh, when you're watching the show on YouTube, sometimes they show what's coming up in the coming weeks, and I think it was either on this episode or the one before where they listed the upcoming episodes of MLW Fusion and the one said uh, in February for it to be MLW Fusion slash Filthy Island or something like that. So I kind of figured 
that's what it was. It was kind of be a filthy team, filthy Tom Lawler, yeah, themed version of MLW Fusion coming up. And yeah, like you said, uh, more of that going to be fleshed out through the night here as well too. But fantastic that again, this whole tension between the Von Ericks and Team Filthy has been building up, and now Tom Lawler and Team Filthy are going to be taking their show right into the backyard of the Von Ericks. Yeah, this is good. I, I like this idea a lot. I'm not sure how it's going to be executed because uh, they've kind of also been hinting that this whole idea is a bit of a sham and that uh, uh, that there's no sponsors that want to the island ship there for pumping out and all that so uh we'll have to see it, it made it sound like it might be a, a patched together uh, segment of, of some kind but uh, i think it'll be uh, ironic i think it'll be satirical i think waller is making fun of dana white and his ufc island so i think this might be really fun and uh, and uh cut out with the bonnerics don't seem to want up on the island of Kauai. It should be interesting. I can't wait to watch. Yeah, fantastic build for this whole thing. And what a great way to segue. I love how this was built. We go from the Von Erics, Filthy Island, talking about the tag team division, and right into the MLW Tag Team Championship match. Los Parks versus TJP and Buku Dao. Uh, what were your thoughts with this whole matchup? Okay, well, this was... Uh... We talked about this in the previous episode, the big build-up to uh, the number one contendership spot. TJ, excuse me, TJP and Buku Dao defeated uh, uh, Team Filthy's uh, Violence is Forever for this shot. And uh, I like it when it happens like this, where you get to see a team win a match and then get a title match on the very next show. This, this uh, just builds the excitement for it. And... Uh, you know, I didn't really expect TJP and Buku Dao to win that last match, really, so it, it kind of makes more of a this one. I, I couldn't really see Lost Parks getting dethroned from the Tag Team Championships quite yet, but um, it still made for an intriguing matchup. Yeah, at least there was that thought in the back of your mind after seeing TJP and Buku Dao take that win the previous week that uh, would they pull that trigger? I didn't think they would, and I... Still questioned it at times, so it made it exciting. Fun match to watch. Uh, again, I, I loved the switcheroo that the Los, that Los Parks did in order to be able to send in the fresh man to take that win in the matchup. What a fantastic, old-fashioned heel move that was. For sure. And it looks like uh, they continue to use that since there's three members of Los Parks and, and they only need two for a tag team match. There's always that extra guy kicking around, usually hiding under the ring. We saw this when they won the tag team championships against uh, the Vaughn Ericks that uh, they had uh, El Hijo de Parca underneath the ring, hiding in the similar outfit that you sneak in and the referee would have known. That's good stuff. Like you say, that's old school uh, wrestling rule breaking. You like to see it, and it made for a compelling match. Yeah, it sure did. And so, yeah, Los Parks retaining their championships. But again, we go back to that story, that tension that you were talking about earlier between TJP and Buku Dao. Buku Dao trying to make amends for taking the loss. I mean, again, this was... I it, the, What I liked about this is Buku Dao really came across as that wrestling student, the young kid in wrestling school that's still being taught by his, uh, his mentor, TJP, trying to make amends for, you know, not quite living up to the standard he you know his trainer would have expected from him and uh in return getting shoved aside tjp not having any of it and pushes buku dao down uh building this big tension between the two of them yeah and did you feel like uh tjp's kind of being a little bit unreasonable about this like uh, even in the last couple matches we've seen where he's uh showed his frustration and, and disdain for a Buku Dao, but uh, I never felt like Buku Dao underperformed, really. Like, he, he got pinned in this match, but it was only through tremendous shenanigans from a very strong and, and experienced team. I don't think there's any shame in losing uh, losing pretty to Lost Parks. I mean, they're going to get you one way or the other, and, and was just a young star, too. You can't expect him to... Uh, 
to completely overperform all the time when he's got these cheating heels that are just doing anything under the sun to get you. But uh, yeah, TJP not having it expects more from Dow, and uh, it, it's kind of sad to see that the kid's playing it good. He, he looks very sad and, and almost uh, in tears kind of by TJP's reaction. <laughs> Yeah. Quite nicely done by the guys. Yeah, I mean, especially Buku Dell. I mean, for being such a young wrestler, he had that he had that moment down well. That whole I can't believe I just kind of been a little bit betrayed by you know my mentor here. That it looked nice. I liked how it looked, and I gotta say, like from what I've seen of TJP's career uh, pre MLW and everything else, I always seem to like him a little bit more when he's got that little bit of a. A, a snarky, arrogant attitude and stuff. He he plays that so so much better than the baby face kind of thing. So I kind of excited to see where this ends up going and stuff like that as this develops. I think it'll also be a great way for Buku Dao to continue to get over. If this is the baby face character they, they want to make a big push with MLW, they've done a good job getting him to this point. A feud with TJP would be really great on the books for him, especially this young in his career. Yeah, I think so too. And, and they're going to take time and develop this this young star. And uh, here's another guy that's of a smaller stature, lighter weight. This will be another guy that will be in contention for that MLW middleweight title one of these days. And uh, I think the way wrestling's going uh, these days, there's a lot of um, what you would call smaller sized stars that the uh, 200 less guys. And uh, a, lo- a lot of fans take that style too. Very exciting, moving and with uh, aerial tactics. Uh, I think MLW is to feature this uh, division in their show, and I think they'll gain popularity from it. Yeah, I agree with you, man, 100%. Uh, so, yeah, so, oh, sorry. Munson. Yeah. Sorry, Munson. One more. They'll be able to match. Uh, of course, Los Sparks will. Uh, Brought to the ring by Selena De La Renta. Did you notice in this match that she always looks like a million, she's like a glamorous movie star, some kind of a nice uh, black tight dress on? Did you notice that she was in her socks? No, I didn't actually. No, I didn't pay attention to that. I missed that part. It's like, why hell is she in those socks? And this fancy cocktail dress, and then I remember it read on Twitter that someone asked her that question right after this episode at first that I aired, and she answered that somebody back they stolen her shoes. Jesus <laughs> Christ! I won't over you that night because I know that's the kind of thing you're in. I admire your taste. Very beautiful, but that's still a bit weird if you took those months. <laughs> well, it might be hard to do, seeing as uh, I would have had to cross the border, quarantine, and uh, then make it all the way down there. Um, you know, something timeline wise doesn't make sense there, Papa Smokes. But hey, well, I, I I appreciate a good jab every once in a while. It's been a long time since we got our jabs in. The, the joke was there. I had to take it. No, of course you do, man. I I, I wouldn't uh, have it any other way. So, but yeah, no, I didn't notice that. I, I kind of have to go back and see now because I didn't take notice of that. So something I'm going to go back on one, episode 120 and look out for. And uh, hopefully everybody else uh, does too. So uh, after that, uh, moving on from there, we got a promo from Leo Rush. This was in response to the challenge made by the Laredo Kid for the double championship match, Triple A. Uh, I believe theirs is the cruiserweight championship in AAA, a middleweight yeah. championship of MLW. The two belts on the line, Leo Rush cutting a nice promo and accepting the challenge. We're going to get this match, Bob Smokes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we all we talked about the Laredo kids' nice, serious promo about uh, wanting this shot. And I kind of expected uh, Leo Rush as kind of a cowardly heel champion to maybe... Uh, Streak him along, or, or you know, just deny him that shot, or, or you know, just uh, waste some time for a little bit first. But no, Leo said that I appreciate someone who has game, to, and I have game too. So uh, let's make it happen in the ring. And uh, I again, I appreciate this. MLW makes it uh, about sportsmen wanting challenges in their uh, sporting life and wanting. Uh, Greater competition, so uh, 
hey, here we're going to have these two together. They're going to make some moments. I, I have no doubt of that. And uh, uh, both rising stars, I think. Laredo did much earlier in his career. Leo Rush has been up to the big leagues down again. But I think this is going to be a wild man. And, and just of the couple of Leo Rush I've seen so far, he's looking excellent. So I expect big things to this club. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. Really looking forward to this. I think there's a lot of potential here. And, man, we get, we keep talking about the international flavor, but, man, AAA sending over their champion, Laredo Kid, and he's going to put this title on the line. So, again, they AAA would have to sanction permission for being able to put their championship on the line in an MLW matchup as well, too. Uh, this could mean big things, too. It opens the door for whoever wins to not only, you know, further their career in – North America, but also, or sorry, uh, in America, but also be able to take that down to Mexico as well, too, uh, into AAA as their champion as well. So a lot of big things that you're, no matter who walks out as the champion. Agreed. And another thing I like about uh, uh, different Fed trading talent, that is that um, because MLW has a working relationship with AAA, it's it's feasible that that their title, that AAA's title, could be lost in MLW and held by an MLW wrestler who would then go down to Mexico and still defend that belt against the Mexican fans. I mean, we've seen uh, interpromotional matches before where somebody comes in with a different belt and says they're going to defend it, but it doesn't seem realistic that they would lose it there because, uh, for various reasons, that the it's a one-time shot or, or a, you know, their, their wrestler is just uh, making a, a brief tour, a brief stop or a one shot in this other federation. So it's not realistic to think that they would lose their belt. But in this case, when it's a talent uh, sharing situation like that, it's entirely possible that that AAA uh, title could be won by an MLW wrestler and uh, that just makes it more uncertain and, and more fun for the fan because uh, there's just greater possibility of, of who could win and who could lose. Yeah, it's uh, it makes up for a lot of great tension going into this one and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, from there, we went on to the Filthy Island preview. So we were talking about this before here, Papa Smokes, but this was the official preview. So I guess this was kind of... Uh, Alicia too coming out and being able to give us a little bit more about Filthy Island and the boys laying down what uh, what's going to be there. Uh, I thought it was comical when they first introduced, okay, featured at uh, Filthy Island and at first you see Kevin Koo and Gabrini shown on the screen. And it's like, well, yeah, okay, no shit, those guys are going to be at Filthy Island. So I kind of had to chuckle at that. But then they laid down a legitimate match here for us in a King of the Knockouts too, King Mo and Low Key are going to take place at Filthy Island. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that exciting? We just came with that in the previous episode, and then now this is like a prize fight. Like, this is it's still professional wrestling, but I like the way MLW does that sports-based presentation. This sounds like a, a big fight between MMA stars, especially when they have... Uh, when they bill it as King of the Knockouts, too, then you know that we're going to see some heavy shots We've seen King Mo absolutely flatten some people in MMA, and also uh, uh, Low Key has been knocked out some people with that running forearm too. And uh, we're going to see somebody get knocked the hell out in this match. And uh, I, I'm quite excited that they signed such a good match already. Yeah, it, it makes everything about Filthy Island, the comical side of it, become a little bit more interesting too, because we're not just going to see one big long comedy hour from Filthy Island. I'm expecting to actually see some legitimate fight here, and man, that's really got my interest peaked right up to the top. Yeah, this should be good. Uh, uh, for all the questions we had, we're starting to get some in. Yeah, so looking forward to that. Um, moving on from there, uh, another matchup that we had on this one here. Uh, we had Gino Medina coming back to MLW finally, uh, taking on Gringo Loco. So another one of these MLW-based names that we keep having a laugh at here, Papa Smokes. Gringo Loco taking on Gino Medina. What did you think of this one? <laughs> uh, 
pretty okay match. I've been I've been anxious to see more of Gino Medina since since before the uh, shutdown and, and lockout of this past year. Uh, Gino Medina was was debuting in MLW. He was going to be the newest member of the dynasty with uh, Alexander Hammerstone, Richard Holiday, and at, at that time uh, he would have been replacing MJF. Who did, finished up and was headed to AEW at that time. So they had uh, the young Latin star Gino Medina stepping in to be the third member of Dynasty, but uh, even before uh, before he even got going in there, it, it, uh, it got off the rails somehow, and, and Medina was, depending who you talk to, either kicked out or quit from the faction known as Dynasty. So, uh, I'm never really sure what happened there. It, it seemed like they just went through. They made a decision and then decided not to, or I'm not sure if there was a problem that prevented them from doing that. But anyway, now we've got heat between Holiday and, and Medina for this uh, split from the Dynasty faction. And uh, I, I'm interested to see the kid work. And uh, th this is, I think, the first match I've seen of him. I, I've seen him in promo situations before, but... I always kind of had the feeling that he might be something special, and uh, I was anxious to see this match. Uh, what did you think of this uh, matchup with Gringo Loco? I, I thought it was an all right match. It wasn't too bad. Uh, Gino Medina looks decent. Uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done there, uh, fleshing him out a little bit more and going <laughs> forward and stuff like that, but a great introduction back to MLW for Gino Medina, in my personal opinion. Gringo Loco, I mean, again, if this is just a guy who's going to be for developing other guys, it's fine. He, as far as I know, he, there there's an expectation that he's a little bit more than a Bud Heavy or something like that. But I'm yeah. not sure if I'm quite on board with Gringo Loco being anything more than a Bud Heavy personally at this time. Yeah, yeah. Um, he used to be featured more prominently in MLW when... And I, I've watched in the last couple of years, he's kind of like a lower to mid card guy. He he wins sometimes. He does tag team or six man tag matches sometimes. Uh, I think it's it's a bit of a joke, kind of you know, with his name and such. And he's the white guy that uh, the sort of pudgy white guy that does luchador uh, style, but. He's actually pretty okay, and I think the fans like him. And, uh, yeah, he's a developmental talent, but he can help your new guys get over because he's, yeah, something. I like the way you put it, Bob, uh, something a bit more than a Bud Heavy. <laughs> well, again, like, and I, again, that's no disrespect to Bud Heavy or to Gringo Loco. Everybody <laughs> has their place in the wrestling ring and stuff like that. It just, with this match being so much further up the card, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to take it as Gringo Loco is another one of these comical names that they come up with for the developmental uh, prelim guys, or if this guy was supposed to be a little bit more above that, but just a little bit more on the comedy side. I wasn't quite sure yet. I guess I, I'll need to see more of Gringo Loco before I make a true opinion of the guy. But, you know, it was, a, it was an all right match. It was good for it to be where it was. To break up between the tag team title match and the main event match that we're going to be talking about here right away. Yeah, yeah. And like I say, I think they just needed to get this young guy back on the card, back in the ring, having some matches. And uh, um, they could have given him more of a squash match, I suppose. But uh, I think it was a good idea to put him against uh, Gringo Loco, who's got a fair bit more to offer than some of the really... Uh, lower end preliminary wrestlers so uh yeah a bit of a challenge there and uh you know loco's not not terrible you know like he he had some nice moves he, he moves well for a guy of his body type and all that oh and, yeah uh, and i think he he fills in his role on the card perfectly uh, as uh yeah just a few steps above bud heavy let's put it that way <laughs> there we go we've created a new spot on the wrestling card between uh mid card and butt heavy. There we go. That's perfect. So anyway, uh, from there, we're going straight to the main event. This is a feud that's been going on for a while. The Black Hand of Contra, Mods Kruger taking on Alexander Hammerstone, the 
open weight champion, the guy who's been holding the title longer than any other MLW champion in the history of the company. We saw that first match between them at Kings of Coliseum, uh, which didn't end up with a clean finish, a double count out DQ, whatever you wanted to call it. Uh, basically a no contest between them. I think we mentioned it when we were doing our, our predictions for that show that we felt that this one would continue on for a while and it would be some sort of uh, some sort of screw job down the line that would uh, cause Hammerstone to lose his championship. When this one was announced, I kind of had a feeling maybe this was it. Hammerstone was walking into an absolute trap of some sort and that Kruger was going to walk away as a champion. Uh, not really so much how it panned out in the end. and not sure I can really say that there was ever really any kind of a match. This was more of a, a cinematic segment, I would say. This one goes back to the cinematics that we... Talked about on Ring Respect Radio earlier in 2020 there, Papa Smokes. Uh, but as far as cinematics go, this was not one of the terrible ones. Yeah, yeah. I Just even that word cinematic match kind of just makes me cringe a little bit thinking about what you made me watch last year with the swamp match and the, God, whatever those stupid... Uh, oh, come on. You... you, you 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 loved the Firefly Funhouse match, I swear, Papa Smokes. Oh, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. I, I've tried to repress it from my memory. But uh, you did this to me, months, and you made me watch that. But this this uh, was similar to that, I suppose, just in the fact that it was, uh, you know, the the uh, videotaping of it or the recording of it was was more important to the match than, than the actual actions, you know, but uh, we had Hammerstone, the referee and the cameraman kind of out in some industrial yard at night looking for Kruger. There was a little bit of suspense that that came out of this so it was sort of horror movie type suspense where you knew this masked madman Kruger was going to be hiding behind one of these uh, piles of pallets or all this kind of garbage that was sitting around and, and sure enough yes he came out and attacked uh, Hammerstone we had some uh, brawling going on in this uh, Kruger threw a full size pallet man did, did he ever handle a we all know how heavy a pallet is but wow he threw that like it was made out of toothpicks <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and eventually what we had was Hammerstone getting the upper hand on Kruger, getting him down, uh, giving him a couple good shots and uh, going to the pinfall, getting the three count. And then, you know, the viewer kind of realized that at the same time as Hammerstone, just that's not the guy. Like, that's no. not Kruger. This guy's not nearly the size of Kruger. And Hammerstone realized it as well. Just in time for Mads Kruger's sneak it. You know, we presume that the Dennis plan the whole time was to have the double in there at some point so that he could uh, attack from the rear and uh, he of course he gave Hammerstone that, that self paw knockout punch he has and uh, our boy Hammer not looking good at the end of that uh, segment at all and, and in fact the program ended with her standing over Hammerstone very uh, very sinister manner and uh, I've got a little bit not uh, knowing what happened uh, uh not having any closure to that. How did you feel about the ending of this segment? See, I, I love segments that end like that in a sense because, again, it leaves you to guess what is going on. Uh, i got to wait a whole another week to find out. Like This is the way good TV gets written, and I know that a lot of wrestling companies, especially in the modern era, Pop Smokes, want to go to a more television-based uh, cinematic feel and stuff like that, and... I'm I, I'm with you. I don't want to see it in so many ways. Like again, the Firefly Funhouse match had a lot of differing opinions on something like that. This was more grounded in reality than a lot of the cinematic matches are. At least it was a fight between two guys taking place in a different location. So you could kind of get grounded in that reality that this was something a little bit more legit. It meant a little bit more. And the fact that it ended with Kruger looking like an absolute monster without that perfect closure is kind of like the ending to a really strong episode of your, your favorite show where the villain has just got the upper hand. Uh, what the hell is going to happen to our hero kind of thing. 
Uh, this this was a great way to finish off the show, and being that it was cinematic did not draw me out of this one particularly. I would actually say the Bakli Brawl, in terms of cinematic wrestling feel, was a lot better than what most of the big companies have done with the cinematics. Yeah, I think so too, and and it's because they didn't. Uh, you didn't have to suspend your disbelief for this match. I mean, uh, we saw in the in some of these other god awful matches we watched last year, the the Firefly Funhouse and the the Swamp Slaughter or whatever the hell that was called. Uh, there's just uh, too much camera tricks, too much magic. Uh, teleportation, uh, costume changes, you know, in the middle of the match and stuff like that. I, I find that to go too far. Um, this at least was still presented as a match. Now, now there was some shenanigans and skullduggery going on in this, but in fact, it didn't have to involve camera cuts or magic. It was simply that Kruger and, and Contra had a, a, a dupe, a, you know, a, a trick for for Hammerstone simply to trick him in, in a physical manner of having another person in the Kruger outfit out there. It, it's still, you know, easily within the realm of believability or possibility. So this, this helped it for me too. Yeah, for sure. I wasn't sure when it first kicked off, how it would feel uh, at the end of it. I felt, okay, this, this works. And as long as companies don't do it all the time, I think that is going to be the biggest thing. It's, cinematics done right like this is fine every once in a while just like a gimmick match is fine every once in a while when it makes sense when it's grounded in reality and not just done for the purpose of getting the cheap pop from a few people that enjoy this kind of stuff over and over and over again yeah yeah and uh having said that i, I think you're completely right but having said that uh, we'll have this to you what Team, uh, what filthy island looks like in the next couple of weeks. Too. I have the feeling they might go a little wild with that too. But, yeah, uh, we'll I, I, see. We'll see. I've been wondering it myself, Papa Smokes, but we'll see how it pans out. Uh, we'll get to that eventually right here on Ring Respect. Uh, anything more to add to this episode of MLW Fusion before we wrap up the show? No, no, but, uh, but good. They continue to build their stars and their feuds and, uh, we saw Hammerstone and Kruger's feud get pushed another step without without either a wrestler looking weak. Hammerstone, I guess, kind of technically taking a loss there, but uh, not really a loss uh, of a match, or he wasn't getting pinned or losing his title. So there you go. Kruger looks strong again, and we can continue this feud on in uh, future episodes. Yeah, looking forward to it. It's panning out nicely. And we want to thank you again, everybody, for tuning in, especially if you sat through right to the end of the episode here today. Uh, Tuning in and listening to everything that Papa Smokes and I talk about right here on Ring Respect Radio. Again, if you haven't done so already, make sure to click the subscribe button down below. Uh, Give us a shout out on all social media and make comments down in the comment section below. We love to be interactive with the fans. We want to chat with you guys. So give us a shout out. Start talking. We want to get open discussions going with each and every one of you because at the heart of it, we're wrestling fans just like each and every one of you are. So thank you for taking that time out of your days to tune in and listening to our show here on the Video Bros Network. From Palm Smokes and myself, we say take care. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you again soon.